The Night Beat starts right now. Live radar tonight, and there are storms in our viewing area. This one includes hail. Is this a preview of storms to come? Adam Kasky has your forecast coming up. A fire or false alarm? It's a question some residents of the Blanco apartments were asking last night. Last night's fire raising new questions. Is there something that needs to be fixed here? But first. It's been a nightmare living here with them, you know? Tonight, neighbors relieved as a second arrest is made in last week's deadly dog attack. Now a husband and wife are both facing charges. We're learning more about their past and that property where the dogs were able to roam the neighborhood. Here's the night team's Patty Santos. Sliding under the fence, climbing through the holes. That's how investigators say two dogs that killed a man were able to get out of their yard. They would just scrape right through under here. Even if they would scratch their backs or hurt their backs, they'd still get out. Belinda Rodriguez says she was held hostage and kept from her own yard since the dogs were brought in by her neighbors, Abilene Schneider and Christian Moreno about two years ago. We kept telling them, but every time we talked to them, tried to talk to them, it was nothing but um, they were just cursing at us. She says efforts to get police and animal care services to intervene failed. On Friday, she took this cell phone video documenting the vicious attack by two of her neighbor's three pit bulls. Pete, get back now! Moreno and his wife, Schneider, are seen here commanding the dogs to retreat. Both are now charged in connection with the death of an 81-year-old man and severely injuring his wife. Online criminal records show Moreno was put on probation in 2019 for a theft charge. In 2022, both he and his wife were charged in a different theft case. They can move out of here because this was a very peaceful neighborhood before they came. Many neighbors we spoke with are relieved to see authorities involved, but they're angry that it took an innocent life. They should have had the sense to, you know, get rid of those dogs. And Melinda tells us at one point there were four dogs inside that house. Animal Care Services tells us they have euthanized the three dogs that were removed from the house on Friday. Abilene Schneider is being held here behind me in this jail on a $125,000 bond. Steve. Patty Santos reporting live. Thank you, Patty. All right, well, we showed you the storms that are in our area on radar. Is this a preview of things to come? We know it's going to be windy tomorrow, Adam Kasky. Is it going to be stormy as well? You know, we do have an opportunity for storms again tomorrow, late afternoon, early evening, but that's a narrow window of opportunity for even some potentially severe storms. Now, speaking of severe storms, we have one severe thunderstorm that really just flared up and blossomed over the past 45 minutes southwest of San Antonio. This is Zavala County moving east into Frio County. This likely has some considerable hail associated with it. Turning off the lightning, you see this black area here, the purples and the black. That indicates what's most likely a large pocket of hail, potentially hail of about two inches in diameter. And keep in mind, uh, two inches in diameter would be about the size of a hen's egg. Now, this is east of Crystal City, east of Bird, but it is headed into western Frio County. I know Frio County, you don't have it hitting you yet. However, you can probably see the flashes off in the distance and hear the lightning. Even in Frio County, from Pearsall to Derby to Dilly, it's time to stay inside and just uh, uh, wait this out because it's on the way. Actually, we can time it out for you. It's headed in kind of an east northeasterly direction. And that direction could change a little bit. It's moving pretty quickly. We'll give it about 43 miles per hour. So that would mean uh, making it to North Pearsall at about 1131 p.m. Uh, Derby at 10.32 p.m. or there you go, 10.31 p.m. So North Pearsall at 10.31 p.m. Derby at 10.32 p.m. That's about the time frame uh, you could expect to, to get that. Dilly, you're not, a, you're not in the clear. This could clip you as well as the storm continues to evolve and change as it really just popped up and just developed. Elsewhere, we do have a few showers and storms up into the hill country. None of this is severe at the moment. We'll continue to monitor it and I'll have another update on this and our storm threat for the rest of the night in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. Yeah, this is what we were talking about last night. People displaced by last night's apartment fire actually could be out of their homes for up to two weeks. That's according to Opportunity Home. 
formerly San Antonio Housing Authority. They run the Blanco Apartments on West We Sash, north of downtown. This was the scene at that complex 24 hours ago when firefighters were called to help residents, many waiting to be rescued from their balconies. Two people taken to the hospital, several rescued from third floor balconies. But did they hesitate to evacuate? The cause of that fire is still under investigation, but as the night team's John Paul Barajas explains, this building, the one where the fire was last night, is known for false fire alarms. I opened the door to the hall. I didn't expect to see all that black smoke. So you thought it was another false alarm? At first, and then when I opened the door, it was very unexpected. Rex Harris is among those evacuated Tuesday night at the Blanco Apartments. He says false alarms are almost routine, but as smoke spread, many realized this was not a drill. I opened my front door and it threw me. The smoke threw me back. It was scary. I engulfed, I engulfed a lot of you know what I'm saying? A lot of that black smoke. So I think that's why when I came out here, I was feeling disoriented. Opportunity Home owns the complex. Its leadership acknowledge a large number of false alarms, but they say each unit's alarm triggers the complex alarm. A lot of the people are cooking and they burn something and the alarm goes off. Organization officials tell us they know the false alarms can be burdensome, but they think having alarms in each unit is the safer option for their residents. Uh, earlier in the day, the, the building went off by itself and when the building goes off, everything goes off. Many residents had this message for the San Antonio Fire Department. Man, you know what? Keep doing what you're doing, man, because you know what? Regardless of what it is, I'll come out here like five, six times, you know, <laughs> a week, and they still, you know, get, get things done. Fire officials say the next step for displaced residents is making repairs here at the apartment complex. Then the San Antonio Development Service will have to make sure everything's up to code before people come back. Opportunity Home hopes to have that done in about two weeks. At the Blanco Apartments, John Paul Barajas, Quesa, 12 News. Hard to believe they can't do something about those false alarms. Thank you, John Paul. Well, this is a new interim District 7 council member. She's got a familiar name, Rosie Castro. City Council chose her to take over after Anna Sandoval stepped down. Castro is a civil rights activist, the mother of Julian and Joaquin Castro, two of the most recognizable political figures here in San Antonio. Thursday will be the official vote. Sandoval stepped down from the seat, citing family obligations. A jury today finding a man guilty of murder. Leopoldo Mora shot and killed Kenneth Salazar back in 2021 outside a motel. The prosecution had evidence in this case that included surveillance footage of that shooting and eyewitnesses who identified Mora as the man who pulled the trigger. The jury only took about an hour to come up with that verdict. The punishment phase began this afternoon, closing arguments for the sentencing phase expected on Thursday. Because Mora had prior convictions, his range of punishment is 25 to 99 years or life in prison. A shocking discovery made inside a Kirby home after several complaints were made by neighbors. 40, 40 cats seized earlier this week from a home on Happiness Lane. Neighbors reported a foul smell of urine and feces coming from that house. Several animal care agencies responded. Once inside, they found the cats were in poor living conditions. They've since been relocated. Right now, it's not clear if the cat's owners are actually going to face charges. Big news for those diagnosed with diabetes. Pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly says it is cutting the price of its insulin. It will now cap the out-of-pocket cost at $35, and starting on May 1st, Eli Lilly is also reducing the list price of its non-branded insulin to $25 a vial. Right now, it's listed at $82, although insulin is relatively inexpensive to make. The cost has been rising for years, so has the demand for the drug. According to the CDC, 37 million adults in the U.S. are diabetic. Thousands of local families bracing for the end of extra food stamp benefits. After nearly three years, the federal government ending the pandemic era policy that gave families on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, extra money every month. More than 127,000 families in Bear County receive SNAP benefits. Every eligible household now expected to see a drop of at least $95. That amounts to a loss of around $27.5 million in extra food benefits every month just in Bear County. Now, if you are someone who depended on those SNAP benefits and are about to see some of them cut, the San Antonio Food Bank is here. It can help. We have information posted for you on our website. Just look for this page under our KSAT community section. Now for a look at your night beat news flash. The only hospital that serves the city's south side closing its doors. Texas Vista Medical Center, formerly known as Southwest General Hospital, 
They're going to shut down May 1st. It's been serving the south side for nearly 40 years. Texas Vista is a 342 bed medical facility, the only hospital in City Council District 4. It serves more than 175 patients a day. This hospital offers critical emergency care and OBGYN care for the San Antonio area. It's also a significant provider of behavioral health care in this region. I just don't think people in San Antonio as a whole understands how this impacts the south side because not only does it provide a level of care for a significant level of care, it provides really good employment for a lot of people on this side of town. It's important to note the Texas Health and Human Services Department says they have received the closure notification and say a hospital is required to notify them in writing of the closure and also include where medical records will be stored to include the name and phone number of who will have those medical records. Sensitive information. Right now, the search is on for this person. Matthew Williams hasn't been seen in almost a month. According to police, he was last seen February 3rd in the 7400 block of Meadow Breeze Drive. Williams has gauge piercings in both ears. He's about six foot two. If you have any information on his whereabouts, call SAPD's missing persons unit 210-207-7660. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. His work can be seen all over our city. San Antonio continues to mourn legendary local artist Jesse Trevino. He passed away a couple of weeks ago at the age of 76. Friends and family paid their respects at a rosary service tonight at Sacred Heart Catholic Church. A mass will be held tomorrow afternoon. Trevino, known and beloved for his vivid paintings seen throughout our city. You still had on the night beat some big changes coming to TikTok that'll impact how your kids use the app. We'll tell you more about it. And just ahead, a nightmare scenario almost playing out at the airport. How tragedy was avoided today in Pennsylvania. It's next on the night beat. It was a scary discovery at Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley Airport. A piece of luggage found with an explosive inside and now a passenger's in custody. ABC's Melissa Adon has more. The FBI arresting this passenger saying he tried to smuggle an explosive device onto an airplane using a suitcase. According to authorities, 40 year old Mark Muffley, a Pennsylvania native, was set to take an Allegiant flight from Pennsylvania's Lehigh Valley International Airport on Monday. The plane was headed to Orlando, Florida. Airport officials say a suspicious package was discovered around 11 a.m. Monday and part of the airport terminal was shut down. During a security screening, an alarm went off. TSA officers opened the suitcase and found a circular compound, approximately three inches in diameter, wrapped in a wax-like paper and clear plastic wrap hidden in the lining of the baggage. They called the FBI. An x-ray showed the device contained a granular type of powder consistent with the commercial grade firework. They say it had multiple fuses attached, one designed to ignite quickly, the suitcase also containing a can of butane, a lighter, a pipe with white powder residue, a wireless drill with cordless batteries, and two electrical outlets taped together with black tape. According to a criminal complaint, Muffley was paged over the airport's PA, and instead, security cameras caught him leaving the airport. He was later arrested at his home in Pennsylvania. Muffley is charged with possession of an explosive in an airport and possessing or attempting to place an explosive or incendiary device on an aircraft. He's expected in court Thursday afternoon. Melissa Don, ABC News, Los Angeles. TikTok announcing a new way to prevent teens from endlessly scrolling on its app. The social media platform says in the coming months, accounts for users under 18 will default to a one hour screen limit. Once 60 minutes is hit, Teens will then be prompted to enter a passcode to extend their time on the app. Now this new setting is able to be turned off, but if it is, teens who spend more than 100 minutes a day on TikTok will be prompted to set a daily screen limit for themselves. All right, as we told you off the top of the show, we know it's going to be windy at points tomorrow, but there are some storms out there right now, and they are kicking up some stuff out there, Adam. 
Yeah, this one in particular has some really rowdy hail associated with it. This is in Zavala County moving into southern Frio County. Yes, we do have some showers in the hill country as well to the west and northwest of San Antonio, but we're going to focus on this severe thunderstorm where the warning is in effect until 1045 p.m. This is really blown up here over the past hour, kind of popped up out of nowhere there just west of Crystal City. This black area is of particular concern because that's where we have the large hail associated with this storm. This large hail is headed east toward I-35. It's just a few miles away from I-35. I mean, look at this. The hail core right there is just about 15 minutes away from uh, the interstate there, interstate, interstate 35. That's the large hail headed toward Derby and Dilly. This is now taking really just an easterly direction. Pearsall, you're getting in on some heavy rainfall, but the actual hail portion of this storm uh, that's right here and that's moving to the east pretty quickly at about 45 miles per hour. So the hail portion that would hit Derby at about 1040 p.m. Uh, Las Flores at about 1055 p.m. And should it really make it there that would hit Aurelia at 11.03 p.m. So that gives you an idea of the time frame, at least the way it stands right now, looking at this thunderstorm that really blossomed and flared up. Turn on the lightning, you see a lot of lightning associated with this. This lone, basically supercell uh, that recently popped up. Put it into motion, you see its development in, over just the past hour really popped up and blossomed and even some lightning strikes outside of it. It's common to see that uh, sometimes a dozen or so miles away from the actual rain and the actual thunderstorm. So that's the latest with this. And by the way, after the night beat, after the newscast, I will be live on the KSAT Weather Authority app tracking this storm and any further development that we have even off to the west. Now our future cast here, not the most reliable in these situations, but it does indicate more development late tonight. Notice 2 a.m. possibly even clipping parts of Bear County. Don't pay close attention to the exact placement. Just the fact that it's drumming up more thunderstorms overnight tonight and even for parts of the morning commute tomorrow. Then sunshine for the afternoon tomorrow between about 5 and 8 p.m the cold front hits and that's when we have a narrow window of a thunderstorm threat. Only about 30% chance here. Not many of us actually getting hit, but all it's going to take is one or two of these to pop up and they could quickly become strong to severe. By 9, 10 o'clock, it's all far east of San Antonio. We're right on the edge of that severe threat as we get into tomorrow. Again, between 5 and 8 p.m. It's a sure bet, though, the farther north and east you are, especially Dallas, Tyler area, Texarkana. That's where it's just a matter of when and how bad and how many storms opposed to us if they could develop and even get that strong. Winds really gusty with the front tomorrow. Tomorrow evening by this time, we'll likely have non thunderstorm wind gusts 40 to 50 miles per hour. So very gusty. If Friday morning is your trash or recycling pickup, wait to the very last minute to put that bin out Friday morning if you can. So tomorrow in the morning, humid, some fog, 66, 88 with some sunshine by 4 p.m. And then 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. We have that 30% chance. I know that's not a big chance, but all it's going to take is one storm develop to develop to have an impact and become strong to severe. Near 90 for us tomorrow, but behind the cold front, 47 Friday morning, back to 74 for the high on Friday, sunny and this weekend, low humidity and comfortable. Live on the KSAT Weather Authority app, tracking the weather tonight. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We got you covered on the KSAT Weather app. Thank you, Adam. All right, let's turn to spring now. I mean, it's the first <laughs> day of meteorological spring. There you go. So I guess it's great that UTSA is starting spring practice. Yeah, their first practice is Monday, but today head coach Jeff Trailer held his first spring presser for us, and he's talking about quarterback Frank Harris and all this guy wants to do is play football so coach has to kind of reel him in during the spring and it is women's history month coming up is our part two of our sit down with stacy pittman douglas coming up the spurs wrapped up the rodeo road trip and the month of february with a win to snap their 16 game losing streak a franchise record they hope to never see again after losing the first eight games on the trip the spurs beat the jazz 102 94 last night to finish the road trip one and eight that's the spurs first win in six weeks and just their third in 2023 the nine game road trip was 6728 miles it started on february the 6th and it ended last night last day of february doug mcdermott is very excited to be back in san antonio 
it's been a while since I've been in that bed, you know, so it's everyone's excited to to get on this plane and get back and we got a quick turnaround and play Indiana coming up, so just get some rest and you know check our mail and you know uh, it, sh it should be uh, great to be home and um, back in the, the great weather of San Antonio. Spurs are back at the at t Center tomorrow night to host the Pacers at 730. Your back to back conference USA football champion UTSA Roadrunners will start spring practice next week led by seventh year quarterback Frank Harris. They're getting ready for their first season of play in the American Athletic Conference. When it comes to spring football, head coach Jeff Trailer has his hands full with Harris because the dude always wants to play and be on the field. We got to get him, you know, where his body feels really good and uh, he doesn't like to hear that because he wants to go all the time. And, I've got to protect Frank from Frank. And Frank doesn't want to miss a rep. He doesn't want to miss anything. And we, we don't need him out there doing a lot. UTSA will hold spring practice number one on Monday. Today at 6 o'clock, we introduce you to Stacey Pittman Duglas, pictured here with her daughter Esther. March is Women's History Month, so we're shining the light on San Antonio women who've paved the way for today's female student athletes. Stacy played multiple sports while growing up, but eventually focused on volleyball. She went to Clark High School and graduated in 1993. During her senior season, she was a right side hitter and set her for the Cougars. Years later, her daughter Esther became one of the top volleyball players in the area. She earned a scholarship to Central Arkansas, where she's playing beach volleyball. Esther certainly followed in her mom's athletic footsteps. Well, it's interesting because it, she tried dance, she was in soccer, she tried other things, and it wasn't like I ever, I played volleyball, I want you to play volleyball. You know, I kind of let her do her own thing and explore different, the viola and things like that, and just kind of see what she wanted to do. But it's funny because in middle school, we would be out in the front yard and she would want to pepper with me where you pass it back and forth and you set and she just got into volleyball. She started playing in seventh grade as well okay. and just became um, a fan of it. Here's Stacy from 1993 singing the Cougars fight song while hanging out with her cousin Sean. We asked Stacy why should girls growing up play sports? I would encourage it because um, like I mentioned it's a positive something positive to do. It's learning to work with others, you know, um, you want to be the best bench warmer as you are a player because you're going to get that opportunity to step on that court. And when you do, you can have that moment. You can, you know, really get the recognition. So it's a, it's having hope. As I watch the Rocky movies, it's having that hope of being something that you've never been before. And here's Stacy from eighth grade in Rudder Middle School. I want to say thanks to Stacy for allowing us to feature her to start Women's History Month. And we will continue next week with Jefferson alum Gina Perez. The Warrior Warriors finally got the hold signing day. We got it after the break. Take you to Warren High School where the Warriors finally held signing day with multiple football players signing their national letter of intent to play ball and get an education at the next level. Quincy Amos is going to Columbia University. Darian Holmes, Navarro College. Renee Riojas will attend Tabor College. Keyshawn Jarvis, Howard Payne. Tristan Cantu, Bethel University. And Chris Cardona is off to Crown College. I decided to go to Columbia, you know, uh, one, obviously for the education. Two, uh, the coaching staff there just made me feel like uh, I was really at home. You know, no, uh, it's in New York City, so it's a great space to live life and be able to just embrace the culture there. It's exciting. Like, I, it's my dream. Like, watch for them to watch me sign something so big that it's just, it's just insane. I don't know. I can't explain it, but it's just insane. We have more NL uh, signing celebrations on the BGC page of KSET.com. We'll be right back after the break. All right, Derby to Dilly is where we have the hail core of this severe thunderstorm moving. I mean, this storm could very well be producing hail the size of softballs. And this is just crossing I-35 right now. I'll see you live on the KSAT Weather Authority app. Have a great night. See you tomorrow.